Do, do you consider yourselves to be believers? Okay, because I, I really thought this, we're probably going to have all believers here, so I, I was just going to focus this message on believers to, to build us up. So um, anyway, but there will be a part at the end, just in case there had been someone who may be streaming or see this in the future, uh, to talk about how we receive Christ and what it is that God does in us to make us want to receive Him. And it's the sight of this glory by the Holy Spirit. All right, but let's begin by um, reading Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. And let me just remind you, I'm not going to be expounding this verse except generally. Uh, if you look at the title of the sermon, The Glory of God's Love in Christ, uh, we might say God so loved us that He gave us His Son. And that's what's going on here. So let's read this, this passage and let's consider again the, uh, these truths. Luke 2, beginning in verse 1, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Uh, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child, and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary pondered or treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Well, may the Lord bless His Word to our building up or being built up in Christ this morning. Well, at Christmas, as, as you well know, we like to give gifts to our friends and family, to those we, we love and, and we care about. Giving is something as, as old as mankind, really. It, it's, it's always, they've always found it helpful, people have found it helpful to create and to maintain friendly relationships with, with other people. Um, if, if you've ever been at odds with someone, one of the quickest ways you can be reconciled to them is to give them a gift. Now, one biblical example, when Jacob, remember, was returning from Padan Aram, which is the place where he went to, to get a bride and ended up with two, and he was concerned about how Esau would treat him. Because remember, when he originally left, Esau wanted to kill him because Jacob had tricked him out of his blessing and his inheritance. And now Esau, he was told, from his messengers, was coming to meet him with an army of 400 men. So Esau was still angry after all those years and wanted to kill him. So Jacob sent wave after wave of his servants in front of him, each with a generous gift to soften his brother up. And we read in the Bible that it actually worked. By the time Esau reached him, his heart had changed, and he and Jacob were able to embrace one another as brothers. They were reconciled. 
Now, we may not necessarily give gifts to reconcile with others at Christmas. We may give them for another reason. And again, mainly because we want to show people that we care about, how much we love them and how much we appreciate them. You know, we, we certainly do that. Most people do that. We do that. But we also give because we want to imitate our Heavenly Father, uh, who out of His limitless love gave us reconciliation. He loved us enough to give a gift that would reconcile us to Himself, and that is, of course, the infinitely precious gift of His Son. Now, as I've said this morning, what I want us to think about as we think about the birth of Christ is to consider His glory the beauty of God's love in giving to us so great a gift, especially when we are in the condition that we were in. So let's begin by considering, and again, glory can, you know, we can look at it at several different angles, but I think we should begin by considering the glory of the one who actually gave us the gift, and that is God the Father. I think it's true that the value of any gift can be measured by how great the one is who gives us that gift. I think we would all admit that if a dignitary of another country, maybe a king or a president, somebody we respected, somebody we admired, if they gave us a gift, we might consider that to be more valuable simply because of the, the worthiness of the one who gives it to us. Now, the gift we're looking at this morning was given by one who has infinite worth, and that is God. Jesus said on one occasion in John 10, 26, my father is greater than all. Now, certainly that, that is true. And when Jesus said that, by the way, he didn't mean that he's greater than he is with regard to his divine nature, but he is greater than he is with regard to his human nature. But he is great because of his glorious power, for one thing. Because we think about the being of God, it makes us marvel when we think about it, because think about who it is that gave us this gift. The one who is everywhere, he's infinite. You know, his, 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 his presence is just as much here. Sometimes we think of God just in heaven, but he's just as much here. He has always been. There's nothing that he cannot do. He has infinite strength. I mean, he created the universe by speaking a word. Because of his limitless knowledge, he also knows absolutely everything. There's nothing he can be taught, nothing that can surprise him, nothing, you know, that he can learn. He knows everything that has ever happened, everything that is happening, everything that will happen. You know, the Bible says God even knows what would happen under any given set of circumstances, even if those things never actually happen. He knows everything that could be. God doesn't need anything to exist or to be what he is. He is self-sufficient. But he himself, of course, gives to everything, everything that we need. And God never changes. He will always be the same, yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I just wanted to say that briefly because that limitlessness of God makes him glorious. But what makes him even more glorious is his holiness or his goodness or his love. You know, that love is expressed in a variety of ways. Love can be expressed in His goodness to us. I mean, God is good to us. We enjoy His kindness every day as He gives to us everything we need. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. His, his goodness is revealed, of course, or His love in His holiness, that, that He loves what is good and He loves what is right and He hates everything that is evil. That is what makes God glorious. You've got to realize if God was not good and He had all that power being everywhere and all that knowledge, we wouldn't think He's so glorious. We'd be terrified of Him and for good reason. His holiness is really what makes Him beautiful. It's His goodness, His love for what is good. So He is the greatest, the most beautiful, the most perfect, the most benevolent, kind, giving being that ever has been or ever could be. So I just wanted to start by saying, you know, just thinking about the glory of the one who gave us his son and the fact that he is so glorious should make the gift that he gives to us also to be glorious. 
But let's consider, second, how glorious His grace is, in particular, in giving us this gift in the condition in which we were before He saved us. Paul writes in Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, Though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just wanted to kind of saturate us with the thought of that. Because this is another way we can see the value of the gift. And that is by considering to whom he gave this gift. He gave the gift to us. Now, it might be one thing for a king who is benevolent to express that benevolence by giving a precious gift, maybe to another king, maybe because he, you know, that king gives him his daughter in marriage or something like that, or to give it to one of his princes, you know, to somebody who is around his status. But it's another thing entirely, a far greater kindness for this king to give a precious gift to a criminal who deserves death. But that's exactly what God did when He gave us His Son. We were sinners. We were criminals. We don't like to think about it. Uh, we, today, you know, with the self-esteem movement, we don't like to think about the fact that we were so undeserving and so evil and so under God's condemnation that we deserved everlasting damnation and hell. Now, we deserve that not only because of what Adam did to us as he represented us in the garden and made a decision which, you know, the effects of that decision were passed on to us. They were credited to us. Paul writes in Romans 5.18, through one transgression, and he's referring there to Adam's, there resulted condemnation to all men, including us. But also through the many times we have dishonored him. We came into the world as sinners, and all we did from the time we were conceived, well, maybe let's just say from the time we were born, but I think that even at conception we're already guilty. But when we were first able to express a desire, either for or against God, it was against him. And when we were finally able to act on that, we did several things that were against him. Paul writes in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us had ever done anything pleasing to God from the moment we were born all the way to the time when the Lord saved us. And being guilty, there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. You know, the Bible tells us we can't work this debt off. We owe perfect obedience anyway. So to begin to obey, even if we could perfectly, but still not get rid of the debt. We couldn't work it off. And there was nothing we could do to earn the forgiveness for the sins that we had committed because every one of them is, is really a crime against a, an infinitely worthy God. We wouldn't, the Bible tells us, even have come to Christ if God had offered us forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ because the Bible says we hated Him by nature. I already told you, when we were conceived, as soon as we were able to express a desire, it was against him. Jesus says in John 3.20, everyone who does evil hates the light, by which he means, of course, himself, Christ, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Now, that was our condition before the Lord had mercy on us, and even of mankind before he sent his Son into the world. It was in while we were his enemies that God gave us his son. Now that is just simply to remind us how great the grace of God is, how glorious it is. Now, we might ask this question, what, what could possibly have moved God the Father to do something like this? You know, to, to express this grace toward us. Well, you know, Paul already told us in Romans 5, and I kind of glossed over it because I wanted to make the point here, and that is because of his love. Grace is simply one expression of God's love. I think you know grace means giving somebody something 
that they don't deserve. God gives to us a gift we don't deserve, but also in the context of deserving just the opposite. You know, we don't deserve that gift. We never earned it, but we actually deserve the opposite of that gift. We don't deserve eternal life. We deserve eternal damnation. We deserve hell, but God gives us heaven instead through His Son. Now, Paul says that God loved us even before He created us. Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 5. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will. Now, if God loved us before He had made anything before the foundation of the world. That means that God loved us in eternity. And maybe we don't think about this, but to say that God loved us in eternity really is the same thing as saying that God has eternally loved us. His love for us never started. It has no beginning. It has always been. And because it never changes, it will also have no end because God never changes. His love for us will never change. Now, we've already seen that His love for us must be infinite if He could give His Son for us while we were still His enemies. Now, God, of course, being, being limitless, must have limitless everything that He has, right? So, His love for us is limitless, but it's seen in giving His Son for us while we are His enemies. But there are other ways that we can measure this love of God, and that is, first of all, by considering how precious this gift is to the Father Himself, how much the Father loves the Son. Jesus, the author to the Hebrews tells us, is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. That is, Jesus reveals to us the glory and the, the nature of God because He is God in our, in our nature. He is the perfect image of the Father. And there is nothing the Father loves more than the Son, because He bears that image. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And yet, the Father was willing to give Him for us, that we might be reconciled to Him. So this shows us something again, the greatness of the, of the Father's love. But secondly, just... The, the value of the gift in itself. I mean, remembering who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the second person of the triune God. He is divine. And He became a man that He might reconcile us to the Father. We don't want to miss that point. As John Owen told us, there is no gospel if there is no triune God. Father gives His Son, and the Son and the Father gives the Spirit. The Spirit applies what Jesus did. If we don't have Father, Son, and Spirit, we have no salvation. Okay? So let me, I'm, I just want to point that out here because that gives Jesus value, infinite value and worth. And that's why He's able to cancel out our sins on the cross against an infinitely worthy God. And He can do that for so many people. Well, Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7, Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And he also writes in Colossians 2.9, For in him that is in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. There's no question. And then, of course, what we read already this morning in Matthew 1.23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And this, this name doesn't mean that, that God is visiting his people in his mercy and grace with salvation, but it literally means that God is with us in Christ because he is the eternal son of God. Now, Christ is precious in and of Himself. That makes Him valuable. He's so precious to the Father, and the Father gives Him. That makes Him valuable. But let's not forget that um, 
as we see the greatness of the love of the Father, let's not forget the love of the Son as well. I mean, every Lord's Day when we celebrate the Lord's table, we're reminded of this. But we see it in what Jesus did for us. He came into the world to obey His Father in a way that we never could. He went to the cross taking our place in God's judgment, a judgment that we deserved. I mean, we deserve to be nailed to that cross. We deserve to have God's wrath poured out on us. But Jesus, out of love, went in our place and died for our crimes so that he might reconcile us to the Father. So the infinitely blessed and worthy Son of God, God of all glory, humbled himself to become one of us that he might reconcile us to the Father. So the Father is the one who gives us his Son. Jesus, the Son, reconciled us to the Father. And then this third or this last point really has to do with this last thing here. The Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit that he might reveal this glorious love to us so that we might want to trust Jesus. We would never do it if we had not seen his glory. And so that really answers the question, how can we receive the love of God in Christ? Or how can we know that the Spirit of God has revealed this glory to us? Well, we can only know it if we are trusting in Jesus. Okay, the very familiar verse, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? Well, we've already looked at God loving the world, giving His only begotten Son, but now we need to focus on what it means to believe in Him. Jesus here is not saying all we need to do is believe that these facts are true, the things that we've just looked at, that He is the Son of God who has come to save sinners. The word believe means to trust. We have to trust Him whom God has sent to save us. Now, this is where I want to call upon Jonathan Edwards. If you've ever read Jonathan Edwards, you know that he's not the easiest reading, so what I've done is paraphrase this. This is not a word for word. But I do believe it's, it's caught the essence of what he explains in one of his miscellanies, and I'm just going to mention that it's a miscellany because that is the source, but miscellanies are just various thoughts that Jonathan Edwards had as he was prayerfully studying the Bible and, um, you know, he, he spent, I understand, 13 hours a day in his study, had a tremendous mind, and a lot of things occurred to him during that time that ne weren't necessarily related to the sermon he was writing. So he would jot those ideas down because he didn't want to lose one thought that he might find helpful in the future to unlock perhaps another idea in the Bible. So in Miscellany 329, which is entitled Believing Versus Trusting, this is what he writes. Faith is often called trust in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. Trusting is more than simply believing. Believing means we agree with the truth. Trusting has to do with receiving truth that promises some blessing to us. It's the confidence that the one who made that promise will keep it. If someone promises he will deliver us from some difficulty, it's the confidence he will do it. If to make us happy, that he will make us happy with such conviction that we're already happy. Okay, I hope you can see the connection here between trusting in Christ and, and salvation because to believe in Jesus means that we so confidently rely on his promise to take away our sins and to make us righteous and acceptable to the Father, that we know that heaven is already ours in Christ. You know, it's, it's more than believing facts. I, I think we understand that. But it's relying on Him with such confidence that we know we're going to get into heaven because of Him. You know, one of the things that, um, let me just mention as an aside, that we can often struggle with is, is assurance. How do I know I'm a Christian? Well, Edwards is going to tell us that in just a moment. 
But one of the things that we might end up doing is trying to make ourselves good enough to convince ourselves that we really are Christians and that's the way we gain assurance. That's not the way we should find it. We should look to Christ, trust Him, love Him, just soak in His love and let it warm our hearts. And, and, and as that love for Him grows, so will the assurance that we actually do belong to Him. And that really answers the next question because Edward goes, goes on to tell us how we can know that we have trusted Him. It is through our willingness not only to trust Him, but because we are confident that heaven is ours, that we're willing to obey Him, even if it means we're going to suffer, even if it means we're not going to suffer, you know, we will still obey Him because our love for Him will compel us to obey our Lord. Now, remember, I think it was last week, Dr. Reeves, that's what he meant when he said the way that we find the courage to stand for the truth in the face of possible suffering, such as Ridley and Latimer who were burned at the stake in, in England because Bloody Mary's reign, Cranmer was also burned at the stake. I mean, can you imagine what that would feel like? But they weren't willing to compromise God's truth. They took a stand for it. The Bible is the Word of God. It's the absolute, ultimate authority. And we're not going to give that up. And we're willing to die for that. And they actually did. Luther was also willing to die for the truth, although he didn't, in God's plan, didn't have to die for it. But he also was willing to die for it. And the reason why these men were, were willing to do this is because they loved the Lord. They saw His glory and they desired that more than anything in this life. And the worst thing that anybody could do to you if, if you desire the glory of God is to take your life here so that you might enjoy it in all of its fullness in heaven. Remember what Paul says, to depart and to be with Christ is very much better. And the reason being is because he's so much more glorious. His glory is revealed in heaven where we get to see it in its perfection. I believe that's the point of 1 Corinthians 13 as well, isn't it? When, you know, right now we're seeing dimly, but then we're going to see face to face. And that's what we hope for. Now, the Spirit is the one who opens our eyes to see the glory of God in Christ so that fixing our eyes on Him we desi and desiring Him most of all, we rest our hope of heaven in Him and give ourselves fully to Him with the confidence that one day we will see His glory in heaven, knowing that nothing in heaven or earth can possibly keep Him from bringing that to pass. You know, as I said before, Paul says to live as Christ, to die as gain, and to die as gain because in heaven we will get our heart's desire, which is to see what we want to see most of all. That was in Jesus' prayer, remember, as Dr. Reeves reminded us in John 17, Father, I pray that these might be with me in heaven to behold my glory. That is the desire of, of every true believer to see God's glory. And we see it now in the gospel. So let me just conclude by saying that this time of year as we give gifts to the people that we love, let's remember, not forget, the gift God gave to us of His Son. And let's pray that we would again see the glory of His love and His grace in giving the one He loves the most and who is infinitely precious to redeem us from our sins. That's what the table reminds us of this morning is that this one who was born grew up and, you know, he, he lived the life that God calls us to live and he was willing to go to the cross taking our guilt, the guilt of our crimes on himself and suffering and dying in our place so that by trusting, relying confidently on him uh, to forgive us and to make us right with God, he, would, he will do so. So that's what we need to be thinking about as we prepare to come to the table. So let's, let's take a moment and do that silently in prayer. And then after we've done so, I'll conclude in prayer, then we'll celebrate the table.